On May 8, 1979, as Manchester's spring afternoon light filtered through the windows of the Woolworths department store, shoppers moved through the aisles with the comfortable familiarity of routine. The store, with its distinctive red signage and promise of everyday affordability, had been a fixture of British life for generations. Parents guided children past displays of toys and sweets, office workers grabbed quick lunches at the store's popular cafe, and elderly customers browsed the homeware department, examining the latest in affordable furniture. None could have known that within hours, this mundane Tuesday would become one of the most significant dates in British retail history, a tragedy that would fundamentally reshape fire safety regulations and forever change how Britain approached public safety in commercial spaces. The Manchester Woolworth store operated from a grand Victorian edifice, a building whose architectural character spoke to the city's industrial heritage. Originally constructed as a bonded warehouse in the mid-19th century, its thick walls and imposing façade had witnessed Manchester's transformation from industrial powerhouse to modern commercial centre. The building's conversion to retail use in the early 20th century had maintained many of its original features, including, fatefully, iron bars on windows and a complex network of storage rooms that would later prove deadly in their impediment to escape routes. The structure's history as a secure storage facility for valuable goods had left it with a legacy of fortification that would tragically work against its modern purpose as a public retail space. To understand the full context of the disaster, one must first appreciate the remarkable story of Woolworths itself. Frank Woolworths' journey from humble beginnings to retail magnet represented the quintessential American dream. His revolutionary five-and-dime concept, launched in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1879, transformed retail by introducing fixed pricing and self-service displays, innovations that would forever change how people shopped. When Woolworths crossed the Atlantic to establish its first British store in Liverpool in 1909, the opening was nothing short of spectacular. The company pulled out all stops, a full orchestra played as customers streamed through the doors, circus performers entertained the crowds, and fireworks illuminated the evening sky. This theatrical debut marked the beginning of Woolworths' love affair with the British public and relationship that would span nearly a century. The expansion of Woolworths across Britain mirrored the country's own social transformation through the 20th century. The stores became more than mere retail outlets, they were cultural institutions that democratized shopping. Their motto, nothing over sixpence, later adapted as prices rose, represented a commitment to accessibility that resonated deeply with British consumers. By the 1970s, Woolworths had established itself as a cornerstone of British high street culture, with stores in virtually every major town and city. The Manchester branch, occupying its prominent position in the city centre, exemplified this success. The store's interior layout reflected the evolution of British retail through the decades. The ground floor housed the popular lunch counter and sweet shop, where the aroma of hot food mingled with the distinctive smell of pick then a mix candies. The first floor contained household goods, including the furniture department where the fatal fire would originate. Upper floors housed offices and stark rooms, their layout still influenced by the building's warehouse origins. This vertical arrangement, while efficient for retail purposes, would prove catastrophically unsuitable for emergency evacuation. The introduction of polyurethane foam furniture in the 1970s marked a significant shift in British retail. This new material promised affordability and versatility, characteristics that aligned perfectly with Woolworth's market position. However, its presence in the store would prove catastrophic. 
the material's flammability characteristics were poorly understood at the time, and its tendency to produce thick, toxic smoke when burning was not fully appreciated by retailers or safety regulators. The furniture department's stock of polyurethane foam-filled chairs and sofas essentially created a repository of fuel, waiting for ignition. The sequence of events that unfolded on that May afternoon began innocuously enough. At approximately 1.15 p.m., a faulty electrical cable in the furniture department created a small spark. In normal circumstances, such an incident might have been quickly contained. However, the spark ignited nearby polyurethane foam furniture, setting in motion a chain of events that would overwhelm the building's inadequate safety systems. The initial wisps of smoke, noticed by a passing taxi driver who promptly alerted authorities, gave little indication of the inferno that would follow. Manchester's fire brigade received the alert at 1.17 p.m. and responded with remarkable speed, arriving at the scene within two minutes. The rapid response time, which should have been sufficient to prevent a major disaster, would prove inadequate against the perfect storm of circumstances that had aligned. The firefighters found themselves confronting not just flames, but also a series of structural and systemic failures that would tragically impede their rescue efforts. The fire's progression through the building revealed the inadequacies of contemporary safety standards in devastating detail. The polyurethane foam furniture burned with frightening intensity, releasing thick, black smoke that contained highly toxic chemicals. This smoke, rather than the flames themselves, would prove to be the primary killer. It moved through the building with terrifying speed, creating conditions that quickly became unsurvivable in affected areas. The human experience of the disaster, captured in survivor testimonies, presents a haunting portrait of confusion turning to terror. Catherine McGuinn's account, documented in the subsequent investigation, describes the gradual realization of danger that many experienced. Initially, there was no sense of urgency, the first signs of smoke were dismissed by some as possibly coming from the lunch counter's kitchen. This delay in recognition would prove fatal for some victims. The chaos that ensued as the danger became apparent was compounded by multiple systemic failures. The fire alarm system, when it finally activated, failed to reach all areas of the building. Some staff members in upper floor offices remained unaware of the danger until escape routes were already compromised. Emergency exits, critical to evacuation, were found to be locked, a security measure that transformed into a death sentence. The building's original iron bars, installed during its warehouse days, trapped people who might otherwise have found alternative escape routes. Outside the building, the scene quickly transformed from routine to catastrophic. Passing pedestrians initially mistook the commotion for football-related disturbance, a sad reflection of the era's social tensions. The realization that a major fire was underway came as clouds of distinctive black smoke began pouring from the building's upper windows. Witnesses described seeing people trapped behind windows, their faces pressed against glass panes as they sought breathable air. The firefighters' efforts were heroic but hampered by the building's complex layout and the rapidly deteriorating conditions inside. The intensity of the fire, fueled by the polyurethane foam furniture, created temperatures that tested the limits of their equipment. The toxic smoke made breathing apparatus essential, but limited the time they could spend inside attempting rescues. The building's original features, designed to prevent theft when it was a warehouse, now worked against their rescue efforts. The human cost of the disaster would prove devastating. Ten people lost their lives, most from smoke inhalation. 
The victims included both staff members and customers, ranging in age from young workers to elderly shoppers. Each death represented a personal tragedy that rippled through families and the wider Manchester community. The loss was made more bitter by the subsequent revelation that many of these deaths might have been preventable with proper safety measures. The investigation that followed the fire was one of the most comprehensive in British retail history. It revealed a disturbing pattern of oversights and inadequacies that extended far beyond the immediate cause of the electrical fault. The absence of a sprinkler system in a building of such size and complexity was identified as a critical failure. The investigation team discovered that the building's fire safety certificates were outdated and that staff training in emergency procedures was inadequate. Perhaps most damning was the revelation that Woolworths had experienced a similar, though less deadly, fire at their Colchester store in 1973. The Colchester incident had highlighted many of the same issues that would prove fatal in Manchester, problems with evacuation procedures, lack of sprinkler systems, and the dangerous properties of modern retail materials. The company's response to that earlier fire, focusing on rapid rebuilding rather than comprehensive safety improvements, revealed a corporate culture that prioritized business continuity over safety enhancement. The legal aftermath of the Manchester fire, while not resulting in criminal charges, triggered a fundamental reassessment of fire safety regulations in British retail spaces. The investigation's findings led directly to the development of new safety standards, culminating in the 1988 Furniture and Furnishings Fire Safety Regulations Act. This legislation mandated the use of fire retardant materials in furniture and established stricter standards for fire safety in retail environments. The impact on Woolworths itself was profound and far-reaching. The company, under intense public scrutiny, implemented widespread changes across its store network. Sprinkler systems were installed in all locations, regardless of cost. Staff training programs were completely overhauled, with regular fire drills becoming mandatory. The company even began actively promoting domestic fire safety, including the sale of smoke alarms, a poignant reminder of lessons learned at tremendous cost. The disaster's influence extended far beyond British retail. It became a case study in business schools and fire safety training programs worldwide, illustrating the devastating consequences of prioritizing cost savings over safety measures. The tragedy highlighted the importance of regular safety audits, the need for comprehensive emergency planning, and the critical role of proper staff training in emergency response. Architectural practices also evolved in response to the disaster. The challenge of converting historical buildings for modern retail use received renewed attention. Safety considerations became paramount in such conversions, with particular focus on escape routes and the installation of modern safety systems. The practice of maintaining historical features that could impede evacuation, such as the iron bars that proved so deadly in Manchester, was thoroughly reassessed. The long-term legacy of the Woolworths fire continues to influence public safety policy today. The tragedy serves as a powerful reminder of the responsibility that businesses bear for public safety and the potential consequences of failing to meet that responsibility. While Woolworths itself has disappeared from British high streets, the company ceased UK operations in 2009. The lessons learned from the 1979 fire endure in the form of stricter building codes, enhanced safety regulations, and a deeper understanding of fire safety in public spaces. The human story of the Manchester Woolworths fire, the lives lost, the families bereaved, the community traumatized, remains its most powerful legacy. Each year, 
On the anniversary of the fire, Manchester remembers the 10 victims whose deaths catalyzed crucial changes in public safety. Their tragedy continues to save lives through the reforms and regulations their deaths inspired. In this way, the ordinary Tuesday afternoon that turned to tragedy has left an indelible mark on British society, ensuring that such a disaster might never be repeated. The story of the Woolworths fire is ultimately one of transformation, from tragedy to reform, from loss to legacy. It stands as a testament to society's capacity to learn from its failures and to implement meaningful change, even if that change comes at too high a cost. In an era of rapid technological change and evolving retail landscapes, the lessons of Manchester remain as relevant as ever, reminding us that public safety must never be compromised in the pursuit of commercial success.